Brother Parson, we love you. Why don't you come preach for us? Amen. Yes, All right. Thank you, Pastor. Well, I'll tell you what. I said to the preacher a little while ago, and all these great preachers here, and you're asking me to preach. I said, I thought about preaching on revival, but I said, we're already in one of those. So no need of preaching on revival. Amen. I mean, I think you've been revived, but you know what? We need to go back home and keep that same spirit going within our heart. You know, a lot of times we come to these camp meetings, get all excited and shout and run and pray and do all that, and I'm not opposed to that. But when you go back home, you're going to face the same problems you had when you left. And so you need something to chew on. Amen. Like Brother Denny told us last night, I said, I can't understand why God took a great man of God like Dr. Howells out, left me here a little peon. And she said, well, he probably left you here so you could repent and win some more souls. <laughs> so that may be the reason he left you here, amen. And so, uh, but I praise God. I, uh, I told the pastor, I said, now I'm known all across the country as a hellfire brimstone preacher, and I try to live up to my reputation, amen. amen. I got to thinking this morning, I hadn't planned on bringing this message until God spoke to my heart this morning about it. But I got to thinking, this has been an unusual camp meeting. There's been conviction here. I go into a lot of meetings, I hear a lot of good sermons. They're put together properly, homiletically. The grammar is correct. And the doctrine is correct. But there's no conviction. But in every message that's been preached here this week, I, I, I sense conviction. Yeah. I've been convicted in every one of them. Yes. I'll tell you what, and I've told some, I've told the pastor's father yesterday how that message he preached Sunday night blessed my heart. Yeah. I'd, never, I'd never thought about why but those disciples did not heal that man, that boy, when the father brought him there. But he said in the message, and he's right, they took you, they brought him to the wrong people. They didn't bring him to Jesus, they brought him to the disciples. If they'd have healed him, then they'd have got all the glory. Amen. And so I've got some things this week. I really have. And I want you to pray for me as I try to preach this morning. <clears throat> I uh, I got to thinking with all of the good sermons and good conviction and good uh, shouting and good music. Wouldn't it be awful if somebody left this, this meeting and still not be saved? Yeah. Still die without Christ and go to hell. What an awful thing that would be. And so I want to try to be a messenger of warning to you this morning, just in case that you're here in a crowd of this size. No doubt there's people here that's not saved. Some of you may be church members like I was and wasn't saved. And so you need to really examine your heart to see if you really know Christ as your personal Savior. I'm going to read one verse of Scripture uh, right in the middle of the passages that I generally read, but I'm going to read this one and then try to bring the message God's placed on our heart. There's people here that's probably heard me preach this before. That's all right. I've heard you sing the same songs before. Amen. <laughs> and so we're just going to we're just going to do what God tells us to do. All right. Stand with me, please. We're going to we're going to read one verse of scripture over in the book of Job. The book of Job, chapter 14. And I'll read verse, verse 14. Job chapter 14 and verse 14. <clears throat> Job said, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Father, I pray this morning that you will enable us now to speak as a dying man to dying people. God, I don't see these people this morning as, as human beings necessarily. I see them as souls walking around in human bodies. I pray that everybody here will examine their heart. Oh, my God. Don't let anyone leave this place without Jesus. It'll not embarrass anyone. If the pastor's baptized them and they're not saved, it'll not embarrass them if they get saved. It will not embarrass mom and dad possibly if they get saved. So Lord, you have your own will and way now as our prayer. And we make it in Jesus' name as we ask us to fill us with your power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. It was several years ago I heard this statement that Miss Madeline O'Hara made. She said, I wish I could have the TV cameras on me when I die. I'd like for the nation to see how an atheist dies. When I heard that, I said, you know what would be more alarming 
if the TV cameras could be on her about 60 seconds after she died. Yeah. See how she feels as she's suffering in the flames of hell because she rejected God and denied the Bible. That's all I want to talk to you this morning for a little while upon what the lost person discovers 60 seconds after they die. Now certainly it's less time than that because if you're here today and you should drop dead right now before your body hit the sawdust, your soul would be in hell. Right. After for the body and presence of the Lord. Have you ever stood by the death uh, side of uh, the deathbed of somebody who's dying? And you say, I wonder what's going through their mind. I'm convinced there's something in their mind, even though they may be unconscious. I believe there's something going on in their subconscious of their mind. Also, have you ever stood there and said, I wonder what that individual is experiencing right now as they're lying on the deathbed. I believe they're experiencing something. Certainly, if they're conscious, they see their loved ones standing around, and their loved ones are weeping because the loved ones face God in eternity. What happens the very second they die, they no longer see the loved ones weeping, but they see the demons of hell shouting and laughing because they put it off too long. Now, I know there's people, and I hope there's no one of this kids this morning that, that, that believes this. I believe there's people that do not believe what I'm preaching today. They don't believe that a person goes to hell. They believe that when he dies, that's the end of him, but that's not so. You see, because he lives on and on and on. There, there. Now, when, I, when people say that, I know they've never really read the Bible with an open heart that the Spirit of God speak under their heart. Amen. What did Paul say? Paul said, after for the body and present for the Lord. Amen. Other side of that coin is after for the body and present with the devil. Right. Now look at the rich man as he died in hell. He lift up his eyes. Right. That means there's no soul sleep. Right. That means there's no purgatory. Right. That means there's no limbo. Yeah. That means there's no second chance after you die. Yeah. What you are when you die, that's what you'll be a million years from that very moment. Yeah. And so for that reason, you better be sure right. that you know that you're born of the Spirit of God. Yeah. Now what happens six to six after you die? First of all, you realize death did not end at all. Yeah. In regards to the theory of Darwin, you're going to live on and on and on. Yeah. You're not going to cease to exist. You see, people don't believe that. They say sometimes a lover's stand on the bed and they're dying. And finally they pass away and then they say, well, they have peace at last. That all depends on whether they knew the Prince of Peace or not. Yeah. They did not know the Prince of Peace. They did not have any peace. Yeah. And then they, maybe they've been suffering. They say, boy, well, the suffering is finally over. Oh, that all depends on whether they knew Christ or not. Yeah. They did not know Christ. The suffering has just begun. Yeah. And so you better be sure that there's been a time when you've asked Christ from your heart and saved your soul. And so listen, I want to ask you, do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? Somebody asked me one day, Brother Jack, do I have to repent? Well, I said, all depends on where you want to go. Do you want to go to hell? No, you don't have to repent. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes, you have to repent. But because except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. While they are making plans for your funeral, you will be in hell screaming for a drop of water. And you're crying out, my God, I put it all too long. Sir, a million years from tonight, this morning, you will be alive somewhere. In heaven or in hell. Lady, a billion years from this morning you'll be alive somewhere in heaven or in hell. Young people, uh, throughout the eons of eternity, you'll be alive somewhere in heaven or in hell. Now, Job asked the question, if a man die, shall he live again? And the answer is yes. He'll live on and on and on. In fact, did you ever stop to realize now, I know this sounds dumb to you, possibly. Did you ever stop to realize there's not a dead person anywhere? Oh, you say, Brother Jack, I know, but in that man, we have all kind of graveyards here in our town. There's no dead people in those graveyards. Their bones may be there, their body may be there, their dust may be there, but they're not there. They're either in heaven or they are in hell. There's no dead person anywhere. What about the rich man in the flames of hell? Is he alive this morning or is he dead? He's very much alive. Now, I guarantee you he'd like to move. But there'd never be any moving van backing up his compartment door and hauling him out of there. Why? Because that is his permanent dwelling place throughout the eons of eternity. What about this man called Agrippa? Maybe like some of you have been this week. Maybe like some of you are right now. You've been almost persuaded to step out. Then almost ready to take that step. 
But the devil got you by the arm and set you down and you didn't come. Hey, Agrippa was like that. Amen. Can you imagine him in hell right now reliving that scene my, my, and saying, my, my, I almost got saved one day when the apostle Paul was preaching to me. I almost did, but I didn't do it. What about this man Felix? He trembled when he heard the apostle Paul preach looking for a more convenient time. What about him right now? Is he alive? Or is he dead? He's very much alive. What about Judas Iscariot? The lost church member that died without Christ. Is he alive right now or is he dead? He's very much alive. And I'm saying to you just this morning with love in my heart, when you die, you will die physically, but you will not do you. You'll still live on and on and on, either in heaven or in hell. So I want to say to you with love in my heart, please do not let your religion send you to hell. I don't care what, what it has stamped on the tag. It may be a Baptist religion. You may have been Baptist stepped on your tag. Right. Hey, listen, it doesn't because you're a Baptist, that doesn't mean you're saved. Right. You're saved because one day, you ask Christ come in your heart, Amen. you repent of your sins and gave Jesus right. your life. Amen. When you did that, God saved your soul and he made a new person out of you. Yeah. People say to me all across the country, I preach on it somewhere about every week, maybe more than one just. As out in Fort Worth, Texas, as the preacher said, Brother Parchment, if God will let you, I'd like for you to preach on hell every night. Well, I did. And guess what happened? Many, many people got saved. And sometimes people come up to me and say, don't you realize people do not like to hear that type of preaching anymore? I said, sir, I realize that. I certainly do. But I said, whether they like to hear it or not, they still need to hear it. My responsibility to tell them about it because that's what God's commissioned me to do. Hey, the devil attacks me as he does everybody. Oh, yeah. A lot of times people say, oh, the devil never bothers preachers. Oh, yes, he does. I remember being in Memphis, Tennessee, in the Jackson Avenue Baptist Church in a revival. And God laid on my heart to preach on the realities of hell one night. And before I got to the church, the devil attacked me. And he said, don't you know people don't want to hear that anymore? Don't you know that's old and out of date and obsolete? And so I began to listen to him. But finally I turned him off and got on my knees and began to talk to my boss. And I said, dear God, I believe this is what you got me to preach. And I said, I'd like to have some indication tonight that that is so. I got up and preached that message on the reality of hell. Twenty some odd people walked the aisle, most of them adults, and got saved by the marvelous grace of God. That preacher went bananas. He ran up and down in front of the platform. Boy, he was shouting and praising God. And I'll tell you, from that day to this, the devil never been able to hoodwink me anymore upon the message of hell. It's what needs to be preached. Amen. Amen. Somebody has said if there'd be more hell from the pulpits, there'd be less hell in the pews. That may be so, I don't know. We need to preach up on the subject. And so I want to ask you, do you know for sure that you're on the road to heaven? And then somebody come up and they I hit me with this one. They say, don't you know scholarly preachers don't preach like that anymore? And I guess they know I'm not a scholarly preacher by saying that. I said, well, I don't claim to be a scholarly preacher. But I said, I read after scholarly preachers. R.A. Torrey said, I claim to be a scholarly preacher. And I be the old-fashioned Bible doctrine of hell. Dale Moody said, the same Christ that tells us of heaven, with all of his glories, tells us of hell with all of his horrors. Henry Ward Beecher said, The thought of future punishment for sinners which the Bible reveals is enough to make an earthquake of terror in a man's soul. Dewey Tamage said, Not having intellect enough of my own about to make an eternity, I must accept the Word of God and take the Word of God. Sam Jones, the great Methodist, said, To the legitimate end of a, of a sinful life is hell. I say amen to that. I know it's as hard to say. Every soul in hell right now deserves to be there. Right. Why can I say that? Right. God would never send anybody to hell without giving them an opportunity to be saved. Right. He'd be unfair. He'd be unclean. He wouldn't be the God of love if he did that. Every soul in hell rejected Christ. And because of that, they deserve where they go. And so you better be sure that you know him as your personal Savior. Then you realize this. That God has a record of every sin you've ever committed. The Bible said, John said on that day, that God opened a book. The Lamb's book of life was there, and all the record books were there. And man stand before that great white throne judgment and gives an account of every sin that he's committed. Now, hey, there's no secret sins with God. God knows that lie you told yesterday. God knows that lust 
boastful heart you have. God knows that illicit sex affair you yeah. have. God knows yeah. that crooked business deal you have. Yeah. God knows everything about you. Right. I'll tell you on that day you'll give an account to God for every sin yeah. that you've ever committed. Yes, what a humiliating experience that's going to be. For some sinner, I mean maybe somebody right here under this tent this morning. You've got so much pride, you're not come and get on this on this altar on your knees and admit to God you're not saved. You've got to go let your pride send you to hell. Yeah. When you stand before God, you say, oh, I'm not going to get down before this big crowd. Hey, this is a very small crowd compared to them on that day. Right. I mean, every person yeah. that ever lived is going to be there, and there you'll bow your knee. Yeah. And you'll confess with your tongue the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ. But be forever and ever and ever too late. Will you say, Brother Parchment, how in the world could God keep a record of everybody's sin? Well, if I knew that, I'd be as smart as God. And I'll give you another straight to cause you to understand it, maybe. I'm proud to be an American. I fought for this country in the Second World War. I'd do it again if, if they asked me to take up arms, even though I'm too old to go. I'd be willing to go. But you know what? We're going to have to agree that our government is full of crooks. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? It's still the best government upon yeah, the face of the earth. Yeah, yeah. You know what? If you could call the Pentagon this morning, within a matter of a few seconds, they could give you the name, the address, the zip code, and the color of eyes, and how much a person weighs, a very service personnel in the service day, what island he serves on, what ship he serves on. Now, the government is full of crooks as it is. Has that kind of record system. What kind of record should you think God has? Yeah, God knows everything about you. Yeah. The Bible says you need a bare hair of our heads to be numbered. Amen. Now, it doesn't cost them to eat that too, too much figure on some of us. Amen. I remember one night I preached on hell. My mother, who's in hell. By the way, I won my mother to Jesus just before her 80th birthday. And she didn't live very long after her 80th birthday. She went home to meet the Lord. But she was in the service, she and her sister sitting out there. I was preaching on hell, and I said, hey, we're all dying. Every person here is dying. I'm looking at a dying crowd, and you're looking at a dying preacher. I said, the proof that we're dying is that we get old. Our face gets wrinkled, and our shoulders begin to stoop, and our hair begins to fall out. My mother heard the lady in front of her saying to the one saying to her, he's almost dead, isn't he? <laughs> I see some folks here this morning pretty puny, amen. But you see, the truth of the matter is everybody's going to die. Hey, you don't have to be an old man to die. An old woman to die. You can die prematurely. You can die before your time. Then I'll tell you, and boy, listen to this. We've had people say, when I get on this part of the message, I wouldn't get in it with just a couple of statements and I've had people say, I preached at one time in Tremont, Illinois, and a person sitting on the second seat in front of me threw both hands up in the air and said, Sir! I said, Yes, sir. He said, I'm lost. I said, Well, come down here and get saved. He was a member of another church, and he got saved. Amen. I've had people, when I bring this message at this very point, get saved out under the tent. Yeah. I've had them kneel on their knees out in the sawdust and get saved. And then to come to the altar while I was preaching and get sick. And here's the one that really got them. Listen very closely. Listen very closely. You'll realize when you get into hell that Satan has lied to you. Yeah, right. yep. He is a liar. Yes, sir. He's a father of lies. He speaks lies. He'll lie to you. There's going to be many, many people in hell. The devil's given a false profession. He's lied to you. He's made you think you're all right. He can make you feel good in singing and sometimes in preaching. He can make you feel good. Just because you feel good doesn't mean you're saved. No, sir. You're saved because you received Christ in your heart as your personal Savior. Amen. You've never done that. You're lost as Adam's house cat. Amen. Yep. And you're fried like a sausage forever and ever in the lake of fire. And so, don't let him lie to you. Now, here's what I want you to remember. And don't leave here and misquote me. I'm not saying you may never doubt your salvation. I'm not saying that. There may be time when you may doubt your salvation. Here's what I want you to remember. If you continually doubt, if there can never be any real joy and peace and assurance in your heart, 
You come to a camp meeting like this powerful camp meeting has been. Somebody gets up and preaches on sin or repentance or on hell. And you get all bent out of shape. You know what it is? It's not the devil making you doubt. Amen. It's the Holy Ghost of God convicting you and calling you to realize that you're not saved by the grace of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Spirit of God's the one that does the work. Amen. He's the one that convicts. He's the one that draws you to the cross. Yes. He's the one that transforms your life. He's the one that seals your destiny. He's the one that does that. Don't you let the devil lie to you because he'll lie to you about your salvation. Amen. Many people are going to be in hell that went through their rituals. Prayed their little prayers. Yep. Hey, you're not saved because you prayed a little prayer. You're saved because you put your trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. In a meeting one time under the tent, we had a testimony meeting. I said, I want you to stand up and tell me how you know you're saved. I counted them. I think there was 14 people stood up and said, Brother Jack, I know I'm saved because a prayer that I prayed was answered. Cold chills went up my spine. I didn't rebuke them. You see, God does not hear the prayer of a sinner. Hey, you say, well, I prayed that my child was sick and God healed it. God didn't hear your prayer. God heard the prayer of the church. Our good, saved Christian wife or somebody, or neighbor. You ain't hey, just because you prayed a little prayer. That does not mean you're saved. Amen. Amen, There's got to be a time when you put your trust completely in Jesus Christ and said, well, God, I'm trusting you as my Savior. Then he'll lie you about sin. He said, get all the gusto you can. You only pass through one time. Live it up. Then he'll say, hey, there's no such thing as judgment. God's a God of love. He'll not judge you. God is the God of love. That's why he has to judge you. You see, because he let his darling boy die on the cross, you spit in his face, trample on the foot, his blood, God will judge you. Yep. Let me appeal to your intelligence. This is an intelligent looking crowd this morning. Let me appeal to your intelligence for a moment. Have you ever heard of this man called Adolf Hitler and Adolf Eichmann? That was responsible for six to ten million precious Jews being slaughtered during the Second World War, and they skinned some of their bodies and made lamp shapes out of them took the butts of their guns and knocked their teeth out and boiled the gold out of their teeth. You mean to tell me that you think God's such a good-hearted God, he's going to slap Adolf Hitler on the wrist on the day of judgment and said, that was naughty, you shouldn't have done that. Don't you know, they was my chosen people, you shouldn't have done No, no, no. If that man did not repent, and probably he did not, he's in hell right now along with Eichmann and all the rest of them. Well, you say, I've never killed 10 million Jews. Bless God, you hit to kill one. You're just as guilty as Adolf Hitler. Amen. 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 You don't trust Jesus Christ. Right, right. Maybe you'll have to spend eternity in the lake of our... What about all these sex maniacs? What about that guy in Chicago a few years ago that took all those little boys down the basement of his home and sometimes illicit sex affair with them and then murdered them and buried them in the basement of his home? What about that? You think God's such a good-hearted God he's going to let that fellow in the heaven be didn't repent? What is that going you know better than that? What about all these sex maniacs running around cannot keep their hands off of little girls, even in their training pants? Raising little girls, you think God's going to ignore that? No way. Tell you something, I guarantee you he will not. You'll be judged. You'll be, you say, I didn't do any of those things. I praise God you didn't. I hope you never do. But you rejected Christ. Yeah. That's the thing that sent you to hell. Right. Then also he'll lie to you about another way to be saved. Yes, sir. Oh, he'll say there's more than one way. Don't you live that narrow-minded Baptist hill, Billy? There's more than one way to be saved. No, there's just one way. Everybody goes to heaven, goes by a hill called Calvary. There they cry out to the Lamb of God. Amen. Only one way for a man to be saved. I witnessed to a man one time that was in the Memphis airport where they going to fly. Man sitting by my side, and I said to him, Sir, are you saved? Are you a Christian? Do you know Christ? Are you saved? Well, he said, I'm a Catholic. I said, that's amazing. I was a Baptist, but I was lost. Yeah. I said, what did you do to get saved? He said, my priest told me, all I had to do was get baptized, do the best I could, and I'd make it. I said, sir, that man lied to you, looking you right square down in the eyeballs. 
I don't care how good you are from this day forward, how many times you've been baptized, you may baptize so many times that tadpoles know your social security number. That's not going to get you into the kingdom of God. Amen. You've got to come to Jesus Christ and be born of the Holy Spirit. Only one way to be saved. That's through the blood of Jesus. You've got to believe in the virgin birth of the Son of God. You know, I can always tell when I'm asked a loaded question. I was, <laughs> we was in a meeting down in the fellowship hall. A bunch of preachers down there. One of them said to me, Brother Jack. I said, yes, sir. He said, can a person be saved and not believe in the virgin birth of Jesus? I recognize it as a loaded question. I said, well, when you got saved, you may have been like me. I'd never heard the term virgin birth. But I said, when I got saved and somebody told me about Jesus being born of a virgin, I said, there's something begin to turn service off on the inside of me. But I said, if you, if you hear the truth of the Bible and deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, no, you cannot be saved. No way you can be saved and deny the virgin birth of Christ. Amen. So there's a lot of people today. I'm telling you, they're twisting this Bible around. They're making it say anything they want to say, but it's still not going to be any different from this time of God. Then they say, well, I'm waiting for the jack, and I hope you're doing this this morning. If so, this is your moment. I'm waiting for a better opportunity. You'll never have any better opportunities right here. I go all over this country in camp meetings and revival. I've never been in one more powerful than this one this week. This is when you need to get saved. In a powerful meeting like this one. Don't wait. May be too late tomorrow. Do you know how many people die every minute and go to hell? 86 people die every minute and go to hell. That's 5,001 people die every hour and go to hell. That's 122,400 people die every 24 hours and go to hell. And most of those are waiting for another opportunity. Don't wait. This is your day. This is the tomorrow you thought about yesterday. You need to come to Jesus today. And then, let me hurry, you also realize there is a real, literal burning fire in hell. It's not just a hunger and thirst for righteousness. For God, it's a real fire. I like what the pastor said Sunday morning. He said, boy, when the hell does it by having boiling hot water poured on your body all the boiling hot water. I thought, my soul, how horrible that is. Boiling hot water poured over you all day long. That's hell. There's a real literal fire in hell. And I'll guarantee you a burn forever but not be burned out. I know there's folks running around trying to fan out the flames of hell. The Jehovah had witnesses going around saying, well, the grave is hell. No, the grave is not hell. I got one passage that can prove to you that's a lie. Why is this rich man in the book of Luke 16? Why is he in hell? He tells us why. Send us back to speak to my brothers and they'll repent. That man knew why he's in hell. He didn't repent. That's why I was there. Right. You say you've got to repent. Listen, repentance will not keep you out of the grave. But repentance will keep you out of hell. That proves to me that hell is not the grave. It's real and you'll be there forever. Who are you going to believe today? Some false prophet. You're going to believe dealing with what Jesus said in Mark chapter 9. Six times or three times he called it hell. Five times he said there's a fire. And three times he said, with the worm died not. Now the Greek word for worm in the book of Mark chapter 9 is maggot. You got the maggots all over you. My God, get them all. Get them all. Get them all. They're crawling all over me. They're crawling up my nostrils. Crawling in my mouth. Crawling through my hair. Get them all. But you can't. And then the book of Isaiah where it says the worm is under thee and the worms cover thee. The Hebrew word for worm is maggot. They're everywhere. That's hell. Young lady, you think of me, you precious young teenagers and worms, you're not saved. Think of you going into hell and those worms crawling all over your body. There you are saying, my God, why did not listen to that evangelist get saved? You better come before it's eternity too late. Yes. Have you ever witnessed anybody dying? I remember hearing about a man driving his big 18-wheeler down the highway. He had a wreck. Turned it over in the ditch. Caught it on fire. He was trapped in the cab and couldn't get out. No way could get him out of there. He was still alive. 
He began to burn. He began to scream. He said, my God, somebody get a 30-30 rifle and shoot me between the eyes. I'm burning up alive in this fire. I said, oh, my, my, that fire is that hot, what it may be like in hell. Another man turned his automobile over and he was trapped there and half of his body was out of the car and half of his leg from his legs it was on the inside and he was on fire, he was burning and he said, somebody will get a meat saw. Saw my legs off. I'm burning up alive. I thought, my goodness, if a man if that fire is that hot he wants to saw his legs off without even anything to dull the pain, what it means must be like in hell. I'm not telling you where to go and spend a summer's vacation. I'm telling you where you're going to live forever and yeah. ever and oh, ever yeah. and ever yeah. without any hope whatsoever of ever getting out. And then you realize you missed the greatest opportunity in all your life. What is the greatest sign? What are you hearing this world for? This world is God's dressing room for eternity. This is where you pull off your old dirty rags and put on the righteousness of God, which is Christ. Amen. This is where you get ready. How many profit a man be gained the whole world lose his own soul? People think, oh, this is for having a good time. Carlo the teenager is driving down the road one day. And they was having the fun, they thought, as far as the world's concerned. They pulled up to a service station. And the, the driver said, he was, a, he was a spokesman for the crowd, he said, let's have some fun. They said, all right. He pulled in the service station. The gentleman came out to wait on him, an elderly gentleman. And the driver said, sir, when he asked him, can I help you young people? Yes, sir. Give us some directions. Well, what do you want to know? They said, how far is it to hell? Began to laugh and put his foot on the accelerator. The tire squealed. They went away at a really great speed, laughing and mocking hell. With that carload of teenagers, it was five blocks to hell. Had a wreck and killed every one of them. I say to people, you can laugh your way into hell, but you ain't laugh your way out of hell. I see people I don't see this morning, praise God, but sometime when you preach like this, I see people laughing. I see people mocking, making fun. I say, hey, you can match your way in, but you can't match your way out. You better be sure you're ready to meet God when that hour comes. God may never give you another opportunity. You're going to realize that you missed heaven. Now I realize where, where Jesus is talking about down in the heart of the earth where Hades was and where paradise was at that time. The Old Testament saints over here and the New Testament saints over here. I realize, brother, the lost over here. I realize that. But Jesus came down and moved it out. And the rich man looked across and he saw Lazarus. You know what? I still believe even though Jesus moved paradise into heaven when he lived all those captivities out and he went into heaven, that where paradise is today. Yeah. I believe the folks in hell can look up and see those of us that's in heaven. Amen. They can see us shouting around the throne of God singing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Yeah. Then they'll sink back into hell for another million years. Hear the same old refrain, forever, forever, forever. And God may let you get ahead above the flames for another moment, and we're still shouting. We're still praising God. There you see, that goes on throughout the eons of eternity. You'll see your mother up there. You'll see your pastor up there. You'll see your dad up there. You'll see your friends up there. But there you are in hell said, oh, if I'd have owned it, listen, I could be here. You know what? There's no hope. There's no gratification whatsoever now. Have you ever been sleeping? So sleepy, you can't hardly stand it. driving down the road. Sometimes I get so sleepy, I just seem like I'd give anything for an hour of sleep. You ever stop to realize there's no sleeping in heaven or in hell? You ought to wake up and say, help me, this is a dream. Have you been real hungry? Do you need almost anything? You're so hungry. There's nothing to eat in hell. Dying of hunger forever. And these sex maniacs cannot afford. And those sex perverse are not. Those sex parties in hell. No, no drinking parties in hell. I'm talking about where you're going to go forever. Don't leave this tent. Until you know for sure. That you're saved. I don't care if you make 15 professions. Get one right. Now, I'm not saying you can't be saved the first go around. I'm not saying that. But a lot of people make several. One lady said she made nine professions in a good independent Baptist church before she ever got saved. I don't know whose fault that was. Somebody didn't tell her possibly. But hey, you just can get saved the first time. Amen. Hey, but if you didn't get saved the first time, be sure you get right. And then I'm winding her down. You'll realize you still have memory. 
Remember, son. Remember. All this. I, that may be one of the most horrible things about hell. Remember. I was in an Arkansas city in revival. There's a man sitting out here again, his wife, and he was lost. She was saved. I saw a witness to him during the invitation. He got angry and said, leave me alone. Someone else witnessed to him. Standing by his side, he got angry and said, leave me alone. I stopped the music director. I said, I want everybody in this building that's got a loved one that's lost in this building, I want you to come down here and pray for them. That lady was the first one down. She came down. She began to weep and cry out to God. Others began to come. Somebody again with it. He got mad every by the month. Let me alone. I stopped the music director again. I said, don't everybody in this building look up here at me. Everybody looked except that fellow and I clapped my hand. Hey, brother, you look too. Look. I said, you see your wife on her knees? You hear her crying? See those tears falling on the floor? I said, you know why she's doing that? You're lost and on the road to hell and she's upset about it. I said, if you leave this building without Jesus Christ and die, you'll live this scene forever and ever and ever in hell. He got mad at the fight that was on a Saturday night. He left and said, I'll not go back and hear that smart aleck preach anymore. And on Sunday morning, his wife told on him. He's in the bathroom shaving and he cried out, Honey! I'll be this morning when I go to give myself to Christ. I couldn't stand it. All I could see last night was you on your knees. Here you crying. See those tears falling on the floor? I said, I've got to live for that forever. I can't stand it. i got to get saved. Amen. Amen. Oh, listen, you can try to push it off. You can try to ignore it, but you can't ignore it. You'll lose, you'll lose. There's all the opportunities to ever get saved. Now, this may be your last opportunity. I pray that it's not. Sometimes, you know, preachers know when God speaks to their heart, when the Spirit speaks to them, they know. They know. I remember one night, I was preaching on blaspheming the Holy Ghost in a revival. And God spoke to my heart just as plain, only not in an audible voice. And he said, there's somebody here this night. If they don't get saved tonight, then I want you to tell them this is their last chance. I said, oh, God, I don't want to say that. He said, say it. I said, but God, I don't want to say that. He said, you mind me. And I stopped the music director and I said, it. God just told me there's somebody here that if you don't get saved this morning, tonight, this is your last chance. The lady back in the back of that building jumped up and screamed like a panther and said, It's me! He came running down the aisle and got saved. <laughs> Every time I'm within 50 or 75 miles of that place, you'll come and hear us preach again. She said, That was my last chance and I knew it! God speaking to you today for the last time. Is he speaking to you for the last time? You don't know when the last time is. Now, God had impressed upon my heart that anybody here, this, this is their last time yet. He might. But is it? You don't know. Young fellow came up to preacher one day and said, Preacher, how long before you die should you know for sure you're saved? And the preacher said, Well, son, at least five minutes before you die, you better be sure you're saved. Well, thank you, sir. I'm going to go live it up and five minutes before I die, I get saved. You start to walk away. And the priest said, hey, wait a minute, let me ask you a question. When are you going to die? Well, he said, I don't know. He said, this may be your last five minutes. <laughs> this may be your last five minutes. This may be your last call. Please come to Jesus today. The priest don't prepare to meet God in Nimmons, Arkansas. Several years ago, I saw a lady sitting out in front of me deep down the conviction. But she wouldn't come. I begged her to come during the invitation. Had to close. She left the services. Was in her automobile driving down the highway. Had a freak accident. Ran off in the ditch. Did not even turn the automobile over as far as I remember. If I heard the story correctly. Just probably bumped her head on the steering wheel. Got out of the car. Fell face forward in six inches of water. And drowned. 
message prepared up to God for the end of the year. Don't leave until you know for sure that you're ready to meet God. I sense two powers under this tent this morning. I sense the power of Satan and I sense the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to yield to one of those powers. I didn't ask the pastor, but I think you'll let me go ahead and do it. I'm going to give an invitation after a message like this. Not right now. Wait just a moment. Wait just a moment. Wait just a moment. I was in Atlanta, Georgia. Most of the time when I get down, I have the hand mic, but I'll still speak through this. I was in Atlanta, Georgia. There was a man and his wife in the building. He was deeply under conviction. He wanted to get saved. Every time he tried to step out, his wife wouldn't let him. She'd stop him. And we begged that he was begged to come. And after the benediction, the pastor went back and said, Sir, please, don't leave this building. You're under conviction. This may be your last chance. His wife got mad. Leave him alone. We've got to go home. We'll take care of it later. He walked out of the building. Man reached in his pocket, got his keys to unlock his door of his automobile, dropped his keys, grabbed his chest, fell over on the black top dead with a massive heart attack. Don't you let anybody keep you from coming. Don't you let a friend, don't you let a loved one, a boyfriend, or a girlfriend, or anybody. Somebody's here that God's speaking to. Right. For the last time. Now, this didn't happen in my meeting, but I know the preacher, I think I know the preacher, that happened. A man and his wife was in the services that night. They found a 16-year-old girl. And his wife was saved, the girl was lost. She was sitting between mom and dad under deep conviction, weeping. Mascara running all down her face. And the vanish went back and said to her, Honey, please come to Jesus tonight. You're so under conviction. Come to Jesus tonight. He said she wiped the mascara, the tears out of her eyes, and looked up into him and said to him, Preacher, if I knew I'd be in hell before the sun comes up in the morning, I would walk that aisle and get saved. Well, when somebody says that, nothing else you can do. So he turned and walked away pronounced a benediction. The man and his wife and little girl got in the car. Mom and dad got in the front seat. The 16-year-old girl got in the back seat. They only lived about a mile from the church down a one-lane highway. Had to make a left-hand turn to go down across the little old cupboard and get in their front yard. The daddy saw a car coming, but he misjudged it. He was closer than he thought. And the man was driving faster than he thought. He was being driven by a black man intoxicated, another than this side was by his side also intoxicated. And so as he turned across, that, that car hit him right in the back where that little girl was sitting. Turned it over a couple of times down in the ditch. Mom and Dad got out. Wasn't hurt. The little girl wasn't hurt. She said, Daddy, don't worry about me. I'm all right. Rescue squad will be here in a little while. They'll get me out. But they didn't know. When that other car hit the back of the car ripped with the gas tank. One well, of those men got out and lit a cigarette. Threw the match down right in that stream of gas. Car exploded. That little girl began to burn. She began to scream. Daddy, get me out of here. I'm burning up. And she lifted her hand. You can see it was bones of meat already cooked off her hand. Her hair standing up like a torch. Daddy, get me out of here. I'm burning up alive. Get out. Little girl burned up in that car and went to hell in a much harder fire than she was burned in. And less than an hour prior to that, she said to that event, if I knew I'd be in the hell before the sun comes up in the morning, I wouldn't walk that aisle and get saved. I don't think anybody here today has that much, is that naive to say that publicly, but you may be saying that in your heart. And God hears you. This may be it. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? I'm going to get ready for the invitation. The will come. Oh, and
Obrigado, Sulamu.